Tom, welcome in, and thanks for joining us. As always on a Tuesday, we're 67 days out from Razorback football, and I've got plenty of Razorback questions to ask you. And I, I know you've really been high on a, a couple of the, the transfer guys coming in, and I, I want to ask with the, the transfer wide receivers that are going to be going up against some of the, the returnees for Arkansas football, do you could you see a scenario where Isaiah Satania, who you have as – your highest impact freshman, do you think he could potentially lead the team in catches and yards? Um, yeah, good morning, Ty uh, and Tommy. Yeah, I, I don't see why he, he couldn't. Um, you know, right now I'd say that Bryce Stevens is, is the top slot guy, but clearly from what we saw in the spring, Isaiah is going to get his shot. Um, and, you know, uh, Jaden Hazelwood wound up leading the team last year, I believe. In receptions, and he was a slot guy, taller slot guy. Uh, but I don't know. It could be could be Andrew Armstrong. Could be a tight end. I mean, there's um, Luke Haas is going to come along, and you know, I think Ty Washington's going to catch some balls, and some of these newcomers like Gums um, and some others are going to catch some balls. But um, you could see the last couple of weeks of spring, the the periods that we watched, that there was a lot of traffic for Isaiah Satania catching screens, bubble screens, tunnel screens, and then, you know, just out patterns, just simple things to get him the ball because he can make guys miss. So, yeah, I would say he'd probably be in my top four of guys who might lead the team. You mentioned Luke has. Here's Arkansas's second highest rated recruit, and while they did bring in Gums and I think one other tight end transfer, there is an idea out there that he could eventually be the starter. Do you think when the season's done and over with, Tom, that Arkansas is going to have a true freshman? You think he ends up starting at the tail end of the season? Well, I, I think he's got a ways to go to be able to to be in on the, you know, third and ones and blocking and things like that. Um, but, uh, yeah, he, he could. I mean, I, I guess you would start the season thinking that Nathan Bax uh, would be your top tight end. But I think he and Ty, it's, I think they're going to be versatile enough on offense that, They'll be able to detach. Luke has, and um, but his physicality um, in terms of being able to be in on every play, like you know, on run plays, will will have a ways to go. But you could just tell that Sam Pittman really likes this kid because um, he talked about you know his parents brought them him Dylan up right, and they, their work ethic is unimpeachable, and and uh, he's got great hands. I think sometime late in, in spring, Sam Pittman said, like, he catches six or eight balls every day in team period. So, uh, much like Isaiah, they're, they're making sure he gets the ball in his hands. And, and how much, with, with Dan Enos calling the plays, Dan Enos, you know, reshaping this offense in his mold to, to fit around KJ and the rest of this offense, how much different, uh, what are going to be the noticeable differences, you think, when we, we actually see the offense roll out there in, in September? Well, probably a few more two tight end sets. Uh, we might actually see them huddle a little, little bit. Kendall Bryles' deal was all about going fast, yep. trying to get the defense off balance, and letting KJ read um, and and make decisions. And here, uh, there'll be a little bit more, I think, time spent on uh, surveying what the defense has and maybe sending some stuff in. Um, and but KJ will still have decisions to make on because there's still going to be an RPO, you know, the mesh game. But um, I, I think I think more two tight end. I think we're going to see some two back sets. You know, they did that in the bowl game to pretty good effect. And um, th- these are some of your best playmakers. When you think of Rocket Sanders, A.J. Green, Rashad DeBinion, and even o- Ogustave who comes in, um, they might want to do, you know, get your best players on the field, get two backs in there sometimes too. Um, but – I, I think they're going to be, you know, super versatile on offense. And remember how much Hunter Henry, Jeremy Sprinkle, and those guys were used in the Dan Eno system before. The tight ends will be featured. Yeah, and, and I, I agree with you. I think tempo is going to be the biggest uh, noticeable difference. And then you take the the timing changes that were part of the new rules package. You're talking six, eight, maybe ten fewer plays for Arkansas this year when it all boils down to to the end result. So. I also think that also means your linemen are going to have a little more time in between plays 
maybe conditioned <laughs> a little differently. Uh, I think they're just going to be more deliberate about what they do. Yeah, I mean, overall, and uh, deliberate meaning what? Four or five seconds different in, in getting the playoff, maybe. Um, and here's the thing. Um, KJ has really meshed, or at least he says he's meshed really well with Dan Enos. He's learning more pro-style concepts um, and learning more about what, you know, secondaries are going to do and what they might roll into, what they might do pre-snap, post-snap. And all that's going to be really big on, you know, you keep KJ healthy. I think there's going to be a broad enough offensive package that Dan Enos and company can find ways to move the ball. Tom Murphy with us here on the Morning Rush. Tom, you referenced the bowl game where we saw a lot of Rashad Dabinion and A.J. Green because Rocket got injured. Who do you think is going to be the second team back? Can Dabinion blow past Green or has Green got that position locked up? (laughs) You know, I really think it's going to vary on a game-to-game basis. Look, uh, you can talk about a lot of different aspects of what what this team is and, you know, the the assistant coaches and things, but – Jimmy Smith's work as a lead recruiter, um, there's a bunch of Georgia kids on this team right now, um, and there's a bunch of running backs who he has kept satisfied um, with the work they've gotten behind. You know, I, pro- I projected going into last year they would not have a 1,000-yard back. I thought it would be more like the year before with Dom- Dominic Johnson and Rocket and A.J. Green getting a little bit of action. No. Rocket Sanders runs for 1,443 yards, and then A.J. and Dubinian and K.J. get the rest of it, basically. Um, I, I think I think the second team back uh, could could vary. And honestly, if I'm Rocket Sanders, that 1,400 yards was great. But if I'm him, I'd rather get, you know, 1,000 yards this year and less wear and tear on my body for the next level and spread it out a little bit more. Yeah, so could you have 2,000-yard backs? <laughs> well, it is feasible. Um, however, I just think they're going to be so good at tailback that it's going to be hard to get two guys to 1,000. Um, I, I think they're going to have a very good run game, and you know KJ is a part of that as well yeah, um, because he, he led the team two years ago, and he still had a ton. I think he rushed for 100 in the bowl game as well. Yeah, and- kind of thinking about what the offense could look like this year to go with Thomas. I, we were talking about comparisons between 2015 and 2023 last week, and I noticed that in the first five games, Arkansas only got 25 or more points once, and then they did it every game after that. Tom, KJ is better now than Brandon was heading into 2015. The question is, Brandon took a massive step. Can we see that under KJ? I can they get ready by game four in Baton Rouge? Is is that a fair t- <laughs> timetable to hope that Arkansas's offense is geared up and ready to go against one of the better defenses in college football? Yeah, you'd like to think that they could be more effective than they were against LSU last year when they did not have K.J. Jefferson. And, yeah, I think by, by week four, you should have a pretty good feel for what you're doing offensively. Um, the offensive line ought to be, you know, rounding into shape because – that's a huge question mark to me is how those tackles are going to hold up. And obviously they're going to need a different game plan to take on Harold Perkins because they could not slow him. <laughs> yeah. And he, 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 he snafu'd anything they tried to do in that game. Um, I'm not sure if I saw a better defensive performance live last year. Tom, one of the guys you got from LSU is Dwight McLaughlin, who is very high up in your rankings and is an all preseason SEC cornerback. Do you think he has what it takes to, to be an a first-team All-SEC guy and be one of the best lockdown corners in the league? Well, I think he's going to be in that conversation. Um, you know, he, he came on. I mean, there were t- most of last spring he was running like third team, and I think it was all about, you know, sending him a message. Look, you know, we know you're a good player, but, you know, calm things down. You know, you don't have to jabber on every play. And I think he got better and better at that part of his game and obviously started every game. And he was huge for them. Um, you know, they were, I think Hudson Clark was still a corner in uh, the start of last year. Um, and, you know, Ladarius Bishop got hurt early on. And, you know, it took halfway through the season for Quincy McAdoo to come over there. So he was kind of holding down the fort. He did not a- allow a touchdown until the Liberty game. So you're, you're, I think, nine games in before he gave up a touchdown. So he's got a chance. 
And plus, I think he had 57 tackles. Um, that's a lot for a cornerback when you consider Snacks Johnson, who might be his, his opposite number this year, had, I want to say, 16 tackles at Baylor last year. You know, different scheme, obviously, but clearly McLaughlin is a guy who will come up in run support and uh, make tackles in the open field as well. Yeah. You mentioned McAdoo. I mean, are we pretty much at the point where, you know, it's probably a red shirt at best for this year? I mean, I, I don't see anyone talking about him factoring in this fall. Yeah, you know, I hope, I think the whole whole deal is, you know, making sure that he's healthy and clearing him to be able to play football. Um, you know, similar situation, I guess, with Raleigh Williams a few years ago, but holy smokes, there's a loud train. Um, but, uh, yeah, we're, we're just going to have to wait and see. I think, obviously, his long-term health is the biggest issue. Where are you driving right now? I am standing outside the Illinois State Capitol, Springfield, Illinois, about to walk in. Okay. What are you doing in Illinois? Doing a little visit, man. Mm-hmm. I'm, a, I'm a big state capital. Yeah, he, uh, that's so, uh, you were you were the, the state capital buff. Guy. I forgot about I, for, I forgot yeah. about that. How many Tom? How many uh, state capitals have you been to? What does this make now? Well, I think this is going to be. I've been here before, but didn't get in. I think it was during COVID. That was disappointing. But I think this is going to be 18. I only started this. I started this spring uh, break of 20. I think 17. I remember Arkansas baseball was at Florida. Road, road series at Florida when I started this. I was in Oklahoma City. And since then, I've gotten, this is going to be 18. Uh, unfortunately for me, I've been in 16 other state capitals and, and gone by the capitol buildings and didn't go in them. And that includes like Honolulu, Boise, you know, some far-flung places, Boston, um, uh, Connecticut, and Hartford, and I didn't go in them. So somehow I'm going to have to repeat my steps and get back in those buildings. I'm sure Salt Lake last year, when when uh, when when we went out to see BYU, was was one you checked off. Absolutely. And two years ago, I made a speed run out west and had already gone into Salt Lake Capital, wow. um, and then also got North Dakota and South Dakota while I was at it. How about that? Well, this is not a state capital, but I don't know if you've seen the news of that Rob Manford talking about the Major League Baseball is going to play in Paris, France. 2025, what What about the prospect of seeing your Atlanta Braves in Paris, not a state capital, but the iconic city in France? Wouldn't that be fun uh, to be a part of that? I mean, I know they've had the London series. I watched a good bit of the Cubs and Cardinals uh, a couple of days ago, Those that series. And um, I've never – well, I've flown into Paris once, but I've never gotten to tour it yet. I would love to go do that. So you set it up, Braves in Paris, and I'll go. <laughs> All right. Well, hopefully it makes it happen. Tom, good stuff, man. Enjoy <laughs> your uh, enjoy your time in Springfield, and we'll chat on Thursday. Thanks, guys. See y'all.